Mark Mancina has built a remarkable career, giving musical voice to films of every genre, including the action spectacles Twister, Speed, and Bad Boys, thrillers like Training Day and Shooter, the dramas Return to Paradise and Maul Flanders, and family entertainments including Tarzan and The Lion King. His uncanny ability to musically express the emotional core of every film has resulted in some of cinema's most unique and unforgettable scores of the past 20 years and has gone on to earn Mancina three Grammys, an American Music Award, and even a Tony nomination. In his new film, August Rush, Mancina delivers one of his most personal and passionate works, effortlessly blending rock, gospel, classical, and avant-garde into a gorgeous musical tapestry that never fails to touch the heart and uplift the spirit. It's a great pleasure to welcome to our show film composer Mark Mancina. Mr. Mancina, are you with us? I'm with you. How are you doing? Hey, thank you so much for being on our show tonight. That was a, uh, that was a great introduction. I, I wanted to kind of be writing it down so I could give it to my agent. <laughs> hey, I, I'll, I'll send you a CD copy of it. <laughs> uh, now, August Rush, this seems like a, a dream job for a composer. How, how did this project come about for you? You know, in, in some ways it was. Um, uh, it was... It was a producer who, who really kind of saw it through um, because it was a very, very difficult movie to get made. Most studios didn't want to make the movie, and right. it was very, very hard, and he had to kind of um, you know, finance a good part of it, and then Warner Brothers decided to join in with him. But um, I had worked with him previously on a movie called um, Mall Flanders, which was way, way back in the 90s. It was a Robin Wright mm-hmm. Penn movie, and... Um, it was actually a, an Irish score. It was really fun, and, and I had worked with him previously, and he had this script, and um, he, had, he was going to have uh, Hans Zimmer, the composer, do it, and um, Hans is a very busy guy and didn't work out, and they called me, and I, all of a sudden I read the script, and I noticed that actually in the original script, some of my music, my previous music, was, in, was written in the script, which is really weird. Hmm. Just kind of a you know happenstance. <clears throat> and uh, once I read it, I realized that the whole film was going to be score, and, and I realized that if I was going to get to be this kid, August Rush, if I got to write all of the music that comes out of his head, right. that that's a pretty great um, chance at something, because you don't usually get those kind of scripts. Oh, yeah. So how, what, what about this material spoke to you? Well, you know, I do believe that we are connected through music in some weird way. Mm-hmm. certainly don't know why. But um, I just know in my own life, um, when I was six years old, I was uh, really, really drawn to playing music. And, I, and I, just, I just knew that that's what I needed to do. I had no idea kind of what I was going to do with it. And certainly when I got out of high school and I was not making any money and having to basically play in restaurants, uh, in Mexican restaurants, to, to try to make a living for years. Right. And... Um, uh, you know, it, it was really amazing the other night because we were in New York and it was the premiere of August Rush. And at the exact same time, 7 p.m., was the 10th year anniversary of the Lion King musical. Oh. And that changed my life as well. Only this time, I had my six year old daughter with me. And so, you know, she got to experience this, my music and, and uh, this, this project in a different way. But, you know, through me. So it's just this ongoing, I mean, I just kind of thought that's the real circle of life. I mean, that's what the circle of life is. Yeah. It's this kind of handoff that we all have to do at some point. And I get to do it musically. I mean, a lot of people do it with, you know, photography or any, any, any art form, you know, that you, that you do that you find special with your kids is a really amazing way of kind of handing the, passing the torch kind of thing. Yeah, and I, de- I definitely want to talk about Lion King in a little bit. But with August Rush, um, it, it seems like it was an unusual experience uh, because y- you were basically part of the collaborative process from the get-go. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to being brought in after everything shot. Yeah. You know, usually what a composer's job is, what I always consider it to be, is the like the enhancer, the great enhancer, whether that be romantic, comedy, uh, drama, action, whatever it is. When they have the film, I mean, I remember when I first saw Speed, and um, they didn't have my score or anything, and they were using uh, music from the Terminator, which, you know, I like the Terminator, 
but that music is very cold, and it's not a thematic score. Right. And it really felt like Speed was missing something to me when I saw it. I was like, this is a cool film, but man, I, you know, it's just it's so cold, and it doesn't have any kind of heroic, you know, heart to it somehow. And so that was kind of my goal with that film. That's that that's a normal film. You kind of come into it when they're still cutting it together, but you get a chance to sort of see what they've shot. August Rush was completely the opposite. It, you know, all of the music, I would say, you know, 80% of it had to be conceived and figured out and recorded before they shot it. Right. So that's a that's a very different process. Now, I'm used to that process because I really go back to playing in bands and all of that kind of stuff where you're writing songs, you're writing music. You know, you're not writing to a picture. So, uh, you know, it, it wasn't like it was foreign to me, but it was certainly a different way to do a film score. And and you basically worked from the from the from the end of the picture, you know, the the climactic the climactic moment of the picture back. Yeah, because they, you know, and I, when I read the script, I'm reading this ending, and I'm I'm, it's, you know, the point of the movie is not that August Rush is the greatest composer and he's a Mozart. It, that's not the point. That's what you know, some critics have missed that point mm. because it went right over them, but. The point is that he has one focus, and that is to find his parents somehow, connect to his mom and dad somehow through his music. Mm-hmm. So that's his goal. So when I read the ending, and really what the ending idea was, was that all of the music that's inside of him sort of comes together in a big piece of music. Well, that means music from his mom and music from his dad and music that he may have subliminally heard growing up and music that's inside of him and mm-hmm. you know why do we gravitate towards certain melodies or certain bands why you know why do some guys like really connect to certain bands and other people don't connect to those groups um i don't know what all that is but there's a, there's there, there's something in there there's something really strong in there yeah and that's yeah. what the film's about um excuse me Jamie if i yeah could I, I saw the movie Wednesday night, and I, I agree with you. Um, that if that if that is the goal of the film, you accomplish that 110. percent um, The movie is, is one of the most magical films I've seen in a long time. I'm glad to hear you. Say no, that. I mean it is a really well done um, piece of film, and it has it's like a modern fairy tale, modern mythology, and your choice of music um, pieces and the music is very well done. But I always took it that was the I mean the movie it spelled out in the beginning. Really, that his goal is to use the music to find his parents. Right. I don't. I didn't get the. You know. I know. I know what you mean. I read those reviews too, where the critics were. You know, it did go over their heads, and I, I do. Also, well, and they I were think, also. You know, they were. Excuse me, but they were also like saying that. I mean, it's not like I wrote the piece at the end, and just wrote whatever I wanted. Like if somebody said, write any piece of music that you want, Mark, and we're going to use that for the end. I mean, I had to. I had to visualize what, when you were that age, when you were 11 years old that kind of passion and you're lost and you're in the city and you're hearing all the city sounds and how do you put all that into a piece of music right you know it was like it was scripted in some ways but you know music is so weird that if when it says and then his father bolts from the taxi cab and this and the music that august is playing becomes part of the score of the movie well how long is that and right fast is it you know there's a lot of questions in there it's a magical in a sense, and, and, and you'll forgive my comparison, but the first thing that came to mind was just the end of the natural. It was uh, that kind well, of a, magic. A, you know what? That's a great compare. That's you know, it's a wonderful movie, and that's Randy Newman. So I mean, you're talking about. I mean, to <laughs> that's even- the first thing that came to mind. Now I got. I'm going to say this right now, and I wouldn't. And just because we have you on the show and all that, this movie really grabbed me. Um, and I wouldn't. You know, I would If I didn't feel that way, I wouldn't say anything. But it really just the last 20 minutes of the movie. I don't care who you are. If you're not touched by that, you got something wrong. But it does remind me in a very good way of the, the end of the natural when they're all reunited. And what yeah. I like about the movie also is it doesn't spell it out for you. you don't, it's, um, it's very organic. Well, you it know what? It comes right from the heart. That's Kirsten. That's the director. You know, she's a very young, and I, I hate to use these words because these are the words that people use with music, and I hate it, but... She's kind of raw, you know. She's not glossy Hollywood. She didn't have a hundred million bucks to make this movie, and mm. you know, it's not a. It's really not a studio film. No, no not so a, not at all. It's sort of promoted like it's just one of the many big films that are coming out. It really wasn't, you know. We didn't have much money at all, and um, she got very, her father's gift. Well, I think so. I, I think, think she so. got from, especially when you watch My Left Foot and In the Name of the Father, she definitely got her father's gift. You know what I mean? I, I agree with you. And I, I, that's why when they told me she was going to do it, I thought, oh, that's fantastic, because she'll keep it kind of 
raw and, right. and not too pretty all the time and not too beautiful. You That's know? right. That's right. You know, you, you've you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you recently performed your August Rush uh, work in, in a live concert in, in New York City with the cast. Well, here, you know, there's two different things. I, I performed it in L.A. Okay. Um, and that was really cool. And that was for the Warner Brothers um, studio and for their marketing department. So that was, and I was with John and Jurassic, who wrote some of the songs in the movie from Five for Fighting. So I played part of my score, and then he, and then I played with him. And uh, we had the cellist from the film, uh, who, who was uh, in the film actually, um, who plays uh, on August's piece. Her name is Jen Kuhn. That was really exciting. Then they told me that they were going to have a concert in L.A. of all of the music from the score, but they were going to have it before the movie opened. Which I thought, yeah, but nobody's going to know what the music means. Mm. Um, and what they ended up doing is they moved it to to the Berkeley School of Music. And I couldn't make that because I was actually in New York for The Lion King, so I couldn't make the concert. But I saw everybody, Phil Ramone produced the concert, and I saw them at the premiere, and they said, Mark, Mark, you're not going to believe this. We played the music from August Rush live, and they don't even, people don't know the music. There was a standing ovation at the end. Oh, wow. And I said, oh, my God. And he goes, I'm not kidding you. He goes, I, I, I just, it, it touched people somehow. And so that was a, you know, for me, that's a thrill, you know, because mm. I'm used to doing... You know, I've done films with way bigger budgets, and I've done films that have been a lot of fun. But this film is so different than anything that that you usually get asked to do. Yeah, it feels very, very pure, and 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 that's what I like about music to begin with. Uh, it's a very pure kind of connective, uh, creative outlet. And, and and one of the major themes of the film that speaks to me is kind of the importance of music in, in the life of a, of a child. And you'd yeah. mentioned that. You got turned on by music at a young age. I think you said six years old. Yeah. How important do you think? Uh, what do you think is missing when when musical education is is lacking from the schools? Well, you know the pro- the thing about music, and I'm I'm sure, and I don't know because I only sort of know music. I don't have too many other things that I can do. <laughs> I wish I could actually, but I just don't. I'm just not good at anything. But um, it's kind of you kind of can't leave it alone. Like, even if you, you can't deny it from yourself. I mean, even if you can't make a living at it, I, mean, I know so many people that just love to play music and have a guitar or, or play. Just, they just love it, and they would, just never, they would never not do it. It might not be what they do for a living, but they just will always play music. You kind of can't deny yourself those things. Mm-hmm. And I think with a school, I mean, for me growing up, uh, I was in L.A., and, um, and then a little bit later on in Huntington Beach, there wasn't really a music outlet in the school my music outlet was coming home i couldn't wait to get home yeah. and putting on an album whatever it was i don't care if it was classical i don't care if it was whoever you know whatever band was happening didn't matter to me it was just it was sort of this my own world my own place to go mm. i think with school you know exposure is the key you know you now somebody will play you something from a band you never heard of and you kind of go Oh yeah, I kind of like that. I don't know. I sort of like it. Then you think about it the next day, and you're like, yeah, I did like that. And then you get it, and then you're really into it, you know. Right. But if, if you wouldn't have been exposed to it, you wouldn't know. So, I think that with schools, I think exposure to music, people find their way. Some people love jazz. Some people love pop. Some people love hip hop. You know, it's whatever. But if you don't hear it, if you only hear hip hop, or if you only hear a certain style, you're not going to know what else is out there. Right. Right. So, so when you started, did you give any thought at all to the film composition as, as, as the place where you wanted to end up? You know, it's an interesting question because I've thought about that myself because I don't know about you, but when I look back at my childhood, I'm pretty foggy sometimes. I'm kind of like, <laughs> well, I think, all I remember is I just wanted to make like 10 bucks somehow and playing at parties and doing all that. But no, you know what? I, I remember kind of thinking that that would be a good job when I get older. You know, like that's a good job for an old guy to write film scores. But, you know, I grew up in such an era in the 70s and 80s when, gosh, you know, it's just, they just, they were band after band after band after band, and they didn't sound like the other band. I mean, Zeppelin didn't sound anything like Black Sabbath, and Black Sabbath didn't sound like the Beatles, and the Beatles didn't sound like the Stones. They they had influences, but they didn't sound alike, and so there there was such diversity. And if you look back at film scores, I mean, I remember going to see Jaws, and hearing that music and i thought god it's real i love that music it's staying in my head mm. you know i i that's john williams i mean i got to be raised on such great writers 
in so many areas of music, whether it be, you know, films, or then I'd go home and put on an album, and I'd hear, you know, uh, whatever, you know, whatever I'd put on, and I'd go, wow, that, like, yes, I remember the first time I heard the band, yes, and I was like, wow, the guitar player is amazing, I mean, how do you play like that, there was a whole different, but I loved Clapton, but it was nothing like Clapton, so, you know, it just opened doors everywhere, I'm not so sure it's the same now, I mean, you kind of have to seek it out a little bit more now, you yeah. got to search around, which, you know, that's okay. People do it on their computer, and that's what I do. But um, it, it, I, I hope that it stays accessible to everybody so that people really search it out. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So how did, how did your first break into film composition come about? You know what? I did... I was playing bars at night. So at the time, you know, I would have to learn the top 40, but I would pick the songs because there were certain songs... Like, we tried to do um, certain things, and I just, I would refuse. I just couldn't, I could not play the song. Like, I remember, um, I was like a teenager, and we were, you know, Saturday Night Live was huge. I mean, Saturday Night Fever was huge, and we had to play some of those songs. And I got to a point where I said, you know what, I just, I know we can make a living playing these songs. I can't do it. You know, I just cannot do it. And so I would sort of pick the top 40 songs that I liked. And it was sort of, you know, at that time, it was kind of Steely Dan and stuff, stuff that was a little bit, you know, more challenging to try to learn the chords and try to play them and everything else. Right. Um, I also got a job with a company that did deer gutting, uh, uh, deer gutting videos. They would like direct a video, how to gut a deer, how to hunt and shoot a deer. <laughs> you have the same job I have. Um. Horrible. <laughs> All this horrible stuff. But you know what? I they wanted music, and you know it was. I mean, at the time, I didn't even think about how gross it was. I was just thinking, this is cool. I mean, I got to figure out how to make the music go with the picture. And back then, you didn't really have any sync. You know, they didn't have a way to really sync them together. The machines wouldn't run together back then. Yeah, yeah. So I used to have to just literally do what people used to do, which I didn't know, but you would push play on the video recorder and push play on your recorder at the same time and then start recording and then try to get, you know, in line with it. It was really... Right. And you'd have to start from the beginning every time. But, <laughs> you know, I got like I got like five grand to do one of those things. A deer yeah, cutting I mean, video, really? That was, yeah, and that was like, you know, that was three or four months of work in a club so uh i would i wouldn't get them very often i'd get them you know every once in a while they'd call me and they'd say okay this one's about you know how bears hunt you know and okay great (laughs) but uh you know i sort of got the syncing thing together and and i was really good at instrumental music i realized it because i was kind of right now all of a sudden i was just writing instrumental music and it was pretty good it was actually was you know i thought it was really quite good so when i did get a shot which this is what happens in life you know if you prepare yourself and then you walk around moping around all day going, I never get a break, I never get a break. Everybody gets a break. It's whether you're, kind of ri- it's whether you're ready for it when it happens. Because yeah. everybody sort of gets, I don't mean everybody, but most people get this little glimmer of a chance at something. And when they dive in and they're, and they're kind of prepared, then they can rise. And what happened was, you know, I got this phone call to work on a movie called Days of Thunder. Mm. Uh, it was a Tom Cruise movie. And the composer, which was Hans, had heard some demo of mine, and he said, I need you to work on this song, I need you to arrange the song, produce the song, and uh, I need you to come down right now. So I put my stuff in my trunk of my Vega, and I drove up to L.A., and I would do that every day. I'd go set up, and I'd go start, and I, I, just, knew, I just knew what I was doing. I, like immediately, because I had just sort of done it in my bedroom for so long, I sort of knew what I was doing. Sure. And from there, you know, came... Do you think you can score? Do you think you can do this little movie called Monkey Trouble? Hey, do you think you can do this movie called Speed? It's a really small little movie. Do you think you can write themes and do this movie? And I was like, ready to go. Are you kidding? Let's go. Absolutely. Well, I I want to talk about that collaboration with Jan de Bont because you've worked with him several times. Yeah. And one of my favorite scores ever is is your score from Twister. It it is so sweeping and and fun and, and, and free feeling. And it almost has an old Western feel to it. Yeah, it, it is definitely Western. Was was that a discussion to maintain that kind of Western Western feeling? You know what? Um, that is back when, that was for great times. You know, we had done Speed, and then, you know, he had this script called Twister, and he flew me out to, I want to say Kansas or Nebraska, I'm not sure where, Omaha, I think it was, where they were filming. You know, he flew me there just to get a sense of being in the flat Midwest. I had been to the Midwest before, but you know, when they're filming, it's really exciting. And mm. Just to kind of be around it and see what they were doing. And I don't know, the whole 
sort of Western Copeland, but yet with some rollicking, fun excitement to it. Mm. It just sort of came to me, and I wrote that that opening piece that when they were going over the wheat fields, that was one of my favorite pieces, and I and I wrote that to start with, and then kind of scored the rest of the movie. and And he really liked it, you know. Jan Jan is great, and he he really liked it, and he kind of let me go my my own way on that film, and it was really it was really fun. Fantastic, fantastic score. Thank you. Thank tell you. me about you know, they didn't really like it. I mean, I have to tell you that um, the uh, Steven Spielberg produced that movie, and yeah. um, he didn't like it. And he didn't like the music, and he didn't like uh, um, the editor. Didn't like the music, which was Michael Mann. Uh, not Michael Mann. Uh, Michael, I can't remember his name, but he, Michael Kahn. He's a very, very good editor. Fantastic. And you know, these guys work with John Williams. So for me, I just wanted to impress them. You know. Yeah. And I wanted them to love it. And you know, and you can tell when somebody doesn't. It's like when you cook something and people don't like it. You can tell. <laughs> they just kind of go, Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's great. You know. Really. Kind of thing. But you know what? Jan loved it. And I still get, you know, most of the time, what I normally get from people, now that August Rush is out, I'm getting great phone calls from people, but I normally get Bad Boys and Twister as the ones that people usually tell me are their favorite ones. So it's kind of interesting that you pointed that out, because I, I appreciate that. I worked really hard on it, you know. No, absolutely. It's an amazing piece of work. That's a, uh, another thing, tell me about your, your ideal collaboration with a director. I mean, you've mentioned that, that your relationship with Jan de Bont is great, but what kind of communication do you need from a director? You know, you just got to know what they're wanting. And, and it's hard because they, you know, they're not musicians normally. In fact, it's worse if they are musicians because then they try to communicate on that level, which is if they're very trained, then that's kind of difficult also it's kind of like if i were a director and i'm but i'm writing music and i'm but i'm communicating to the director on a director level it's kind of weird you know mm. um my my collaboration with jan was really great especially on on speed uh, i'll never forget when i played him the main title mm. i mean I, I he came into my room and i played the opening main title for him this is after we've been working on it and he took a big risk with me because he fought for me to have that movie and the studio didn't want me they didn't know who I was, and, and you know they thought I was going to wreck the movie, and you know there's a lot of politics involved. But he believed in me, and when he heard the main title, he fell all, just about out of his chair laughing in relief. Of he loved it so much, and I could tell oh, wow. that he was just so excited and so like this is amazing. This is going to be this is going to blow people's minds, you know. And it was really really exciting. And the other guy is um, uh, Antoine Fuqua, who I I did um, Training Day. Training Day, yeah, right? That's right. Um, you know he's he's deep, and uh, He's difficult to, you know, you want to please him. He's a great guy and he's a wonderful artist. But, you know, you, 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 want, to, you want to get where he wants to go. And he's got a lot of ideas um, and he likes to, to experiment, which is really fun. And uh, I, I love that. I love that combination of us. I, I loved what we did on Shooter. I thought Shooter was, you know, I, I think Shooter deserved better from, I mean, people that have seen it really liked it. I mean, it's a great movie. Well. Yeah. I thought it was really, you know. I like that movie a lot. I thought it was a good... I like the pace of it. I like the understatement of it. I like the fact that the score is kind of subliminal. It's not doesn't bang you over the head, you know. Um, I really loved that collaboration with him. It was really great. But Training Day for me was really fun because it was so disturbing and, and it, was, uh, it was really fun to write that really dark stuff, man. And, and, and you know, some of the subject matter in that movie was so uh, unnerving for, oh, for a guy like me. You know, I'm sitting there. I'm kind of like the white guy in the room. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, that's, that's me right there, and these guys are going to kill me. You know, yeah. I know exactly how I'd feel. Yeah. Um, so, so when you first see a Training Day, just just to get a little bit into your process, when you when you see a first cut of Training Day, um, you you see it's a gritty film, uh, urban. It deals with corruption. Um, what musical thoughts start to form in your mind? You know, I can tell you specifically with Training Day because um, I wish they would have had time or money. You know, the first cut that I saw was about three hours long. And it had all sorts of other twists and turns in the story that were amazing. Mm. And, you know, when they had to cut it down and the studio stepped in and they had to film the ending with everybody, you know, shooting everybody, you know, it's just kind of like, okay, here we go. But the original one that I saw was really riveting. So what the, the first thing I thought was a lot of the music they had put in as placeholders was really good stuff. And that's always a good feeling, but it's also a little intimidating. Mm. Um, heat was, you know, I love that score, I love that movie, and a lot of the music was from Heat. So I was listening to it going, God, you know, this is hard to top, you know. Right. Um, 
The other thing I thought was, I'm not going to write any urban music. You know, I am not from the streets. I am not going to kid myself by going out and buying loops and putting some drum loops and thinking that I know the rhythms of peoples of L.A., because I don't. Right. What, what I do know is I lived in L.A., and what I do know is L.A. is not one thing. It is a mixture of cultures. And that's why if you listen to the beginning of the movie, it's Asian. The very beginning of that movie, mm-hmm. I started with Asian ideas. Yeah. Because I was thinking, you know, Chinatown, I'm thinking about all the different areas. There's, some, there's a bit of a Spanish-Mexican flavor to some of it. Um, it's very dreamy. You know, it... I just I wanted to stay away from the obviousness. If they wanted hip hop, I said get Dre, and you know what they did? They got Dre, and Dre wrote that one little piece in there that's great, you know. Uh, so that's that's the level I was thinking on, and I was very fortunate too because I could say that to Antoine, and he understood that. There are a lot of directors that would say, "No, we hired you, man. Right, you know, start writing stuff, you know." Yeah. So. T- tell me about CD soundtracks because we, we spoke with John Ottman uh, a few months ago. Yeah, and and he said a mistake that a lot of people make is that you're, when you're a film composer, you're composing the music first and foremost to fit with the film, not necessarily to sound good on a CD soundtrack. That's that's a good point. Yeah. Although uh, I would, I would, the only thing I would say is that there are a lot of composers in Hollywood that mix for the CD and don't care about the film. I yeah. know. Really? Yeah. But that's because it gets them more work. I've always felt the opposite way. I feel the way John does. I feel like you got to make it sound great for the film. That's the whole point of it. That's the main. That's the big kahuna. I mean. Well, but you know what? Unfortunately, it kind of isn't in in the respect of those CDs that go out. People use those what they call a temp track when you're a director making a film and you don't have a composer yet. So you you find music and throw it up against your film. Well, what do you do? You go buy CDs. And you use that music. And then you find out, oh, you know what? I love this music. Who is this guy? Oh, it's so-and-so. Oh, let's get him. That's how people get jobs. Okay. All right. so that makes sense. if you mix it for the CD, then you're ensuring that somebody may hear it and love it. If you mix it for the film, you're really working for the best of the film, which is what I like to do. But not everybody does that. Right. Yeah. You know? um, do you feel that the, the best scores, though, can, can have both identities, can work the same way uh, for work equally well for for the purposes of the film and when you just put on the CD? Or... I, you know, i got to tell you, I, I do believe that there's a lot of levels, though. I mean, I have to say, I have seen movies that I thought the score was brilliant, and then I take the score home and listen to it, and I go, this is really nothing. It just really worked in the movie. Mm-hmm. Then there's other scores where I think it's brilliant, and I take it home, and I love listening to it, and then I think that's the ultimate. But, you know... Some movies don't call for that kind of score. Right. And so, you know, um, it, 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 really, it really matters that if it works in the film. I mean, that is absolutely number one priority. It's got to make the film a better experience for the audience in whatever direction that needs to be. If it also works when you take it away, that's an added bonus. That's like a big, you know, golden uh, ticket absolutely. cereal box. And sometimes because I'm a big collector of... <clears throat> excuse me, CD uh, soundtracks. And sometimes just the the movie w- is such an overwhelming experience for me. It, it, purchasing the score and listening to it is it, kind of evocative of the experience of watching yeah. that, that mm-hmm. film. Very true. Very yeah, true. I, I can't let you go without asking you about uh, your work on The Lion King uh, with Julie Tamer. Yeah. Uh, what was that experience like? And are, are you going to return to the stage anytime soon? Well, you know, the, the I wrote... When I did The Lion King originally, way back, you know, this was a situation where Hans again called me and said, would you produce the songs for the, for the movie? It's called The King of the Jungle. And I'm kind of like, well, how much? And he said, I think it was 13000 I'm like, I'm there. <laughs> I'm there, man. Produce all the songs for the movie. No problem. I, I do it. So I got involved in that. And during that time, when I heard the songs, I thought they were really good. And I thought, they need a song for, for that one section where Simba looks in the reflecting pool and sees his own face. And Rafiki tells him that that's his father. And he says, no, that's just me. And she goes, no, that's your father. Hmm. And I thought that was so strong. So I wrote this song called He Lives in You. And I sort of had the idea. And I had the chorus. And I had the kind of idea in my back pocket. And Eventually, when the movie came out and it sold 13 million, and I didn't really show the song to anybody because I was, you know, it wouldn't have been appropriate. But I eventually showed it to um, to the, the, Disney. Came along and said, "You guys want to make an album songs, you know, inspired by one of those kind of albums." Right. Only we had really great, I think, really great African 
and wonderful additions to the Lion King songs that we had written through the experience, me and, and Lebos and, and Hans. So what was really cool is that Julie Tamor heard that CD. It's called Rhythm of the Pride Lands. And on that CD is pretty much the Lion King, the, the backdrop for the Lion King musical. When she heard that, she loved that way more than she liked the movie and way more than she liked the soundtrack. Mm. And she said, get me the guy that did this. I want, he lives in you. Who, who, who did that? Whoever did that, I want that guy to put the musical together with me. And so I got a phone call. And I went and I didn't want to do The Lion King. I, in fact, I had just done Twister, and it was a huge movie, and I was like living large, and I was thinking, <laughs> right, you know, I, I don't want to go do a remake of The Lion King now. Right. But I met with her, and she wanted Lebo involved, and he's the African singer that's involved in the movie. And when she said it was going to be the two of us putting it all together with her, I was, I'm like, I'm in, I'm in. Yeah, so, uh, what, a, what a visionary talent uh, Julie Tamor is. Amazing. Uh, absolutely. She's doing Spider-Man on Broadway. Back I know. You know, I just talked to her. We, we did an interview where we interviewed each other. It was really cool. And, uh, you know, she's doing that with um, Bono and The Edge. Oh, wow. They're, they're, they're writing the songs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it will, believe me, because I know her, and it will change theater uh, in a good way. I, oh, yeah. It'll open up a, a lot of doors for people like me. Yes, I do want to do more theater. I really do. Um, I was trying to get something going with Disney seven years ago. I really wanted to do... I really think that people are hungry for theater where the soundtrack is a lot more current than what you get in musical theater. Right. If you right. Know what I, mean. I was pitching to them the idea of a Radiohead meets sort of a Coldplay-esque type of score for a musical rather than the sort of traditional thing. And, you uh, sold me you know, right there. Well, you know what? I, they, I think they, you know, they're very traditional company, so it really wasn't the right pitch to bring it to them. But that's who I know. I don't know anybody else really, you know, and and uh, in theater. And so I just pitched it to them. But then, wouldn't you know that, like Spring Awakenings, won all the Tonys, which is just really an alternative album. Right, it is. Yeah. And it won everything because I think people are hungry because they're like, this is cool. It's like songs, and you know, I kind of, I don't have to be embarrassed to have it in my car, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> So tell, tell us what's next for you. What's coming up? You know, um, I, I don't have anything next because I, I am in that mode where, you know, if you look at my, my track record, I, I bounce around a lot. I mean, you know, I was an action film guy, and I was the action guy, and I kind of tried to get away from that, and I tried to go a different direction. I'm really trying to do that right now. Um, August Rush, I'm sort of waiting to see, you know, I want to see how people embrace it because i mean i know that people are embracing that movie on a certain level a lot of people it's not a blockbuster it's not the movie of the year necessarily but, but it's it, magical it's yeah. very different and i want to kind of let it resonate and i want to see who surfaces out of that before i make a commitment because otherwise you know i, I otherwise i'm just on the next movie and i've done that in the past and i just want to wait so that's kind of where i am um excuse me yeah i want to you're attached as the composer to a movie called Meg. Well, I'm also attached, you know, there's a movie called Stopping Power. Right. Um, those are both Jan's projects. You would so be a I'm, natural for Meg. Yeah. Well, you, I'd love you, to do it. Just I mean, from your love for Jaws, I think that would be the perfect vehicle for you. Well, and we are planning to do that. It's just that it's not really necessarily, like, official. There isn't a green light and there isn't a due date and all that kind of stuff. So... Yeah, there are there are things that are in my future that I'm doing, but I, I'm kind of, you know, immediately right now not not sure exactly right. what the first thing will be. Yeah. You know? Well, you are a remarkable talent. We're crazy about you on the show. And, and oh, you're very kind. August Rush is an amazing, amazing piece of work. And thank you so much for being with us. Come back and join us anytime you'd like. I'd love it, guys. Thank you. It was really fun.